We are here at the Raymond Wildlife Ranch and Area. This is one of only two places in Arizona where you can actually go and see wild bison. Now, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between a buffalo and a bison? Well, the difference is just the name, but technically buffalo are not really native to North America. Buffalo are the animals of like Southern Asia, think water buffalo. Here in North America, we have bison, but over time the name buffalo has kind of stuck. So if you say buffalo, you say bison, people pretty much know what you're talking about. But technically speaking, these are bison bison. That's the genus and species name. Now, bison are related to buffalo and other bovines like cows. They actually migrated into North America from Eurasia around 220,000 years ago. So during that time, the world was in an ice age and there was a land bridge between Eurasia and Alaska. And like many animals, those early bison, a precursor to the bison we have today, migrated across the land bridge into North America, migrating further and further down into the heart of the continent. Now those ice age conditions led to selective pressures that promoted the growth of larger bodies, hairier animals. And that's why during the ice age, we had things like woolly mammoths, giant ground sloths, dire wolves, these incredible animals that we don't really have today. And during that time, the bison became what's known as bison latifrons, an even bigger version of the bison than we have today. Their hump stood about nine feet tall and their horns spread from tip to tip about six feet across. It was a huge, massive animal. But by around 10,000 years ago, the climate was changing. It was warming and those large bodies were not as necessary. Now, it's still heavily debated today why this happened, but around 10,000 years ago, a mass extinction occurred in North America. Things like the woolly mammoths, the ground sloths, and the dire wolves, they all went extinct. But the bison bison were able to survive, and they actually expanded as other grazing animals like the mammoths disappear, the bison moved in to fill that gap. By the time of the arrival of the Europeans in the 17th century, bison spread from coast to coast across the entire continent. Now at that time, many Native American people relied on the bison as a staple food source. They also used the hides for things like clothing and shelter, and they would use all the different parts of the bison as they hunted them. Some tribes, like the Lakota and the Comanche, took the arrival of the Europeans and the introduction of horses and became even better bison hunters. With the horse, they were able to ride from place to place, following the herds around as they moved across the continent. Now, by the 19th century, an explosion of European migration occurred. And as more and more pioneers were traveling across the continent, they also used the bison as a food source. But many of the people started market hunting, hunting the bison to sell to meat and other markets across the country. Now, sometimes that hunting led to much overkilling. You kill a bunch of bison, you sell the meat you can, the rest of it goes bad and rots. Also, the pioneers and the Native Americans were at odds with one another. They were in a big conflict, right? So the Native Americans used the bison so heavily that the pioneers thought kind of a way that they could exterminate the native population was by exterminating their food source. So because of market hunting and terrible policies, the once massive herds of bison, we're talking like 10 million animals, within a hundred years, they had almost gone completely extinct. And by the end of the 19th century, we only had a handful of these animals left around. That's when conservationists like Theodore Roosevelt started to realize if we didn't do something, these animals would go completely extinct. So around 1905, Roosevelt and a few of his contemporaries started what's known as the Bison Society. And they started to pressure the government to preserve and conserve 
what few bison we had left. So within about 10 years or so, they had gotten together enough funding, gotten together enough animals, and they started managing a herd in South Dakota around Wind Cave National Park. Around the same time, another man by the name of Charles Buffalo Jones, he had been a bison hunter throughout the 1800s, and he actually contributed to their downfall. But what Buffalo Jones realized was that conservation was important. So Buffalo Jones took his hunting and tracking skills and went around collecting as many buffalo and bison that he could. Now he rounded them up and started ranching with the bison on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. By about the 1940s, the state of Arizona bought a handful of those bison off of Buffalo Jones and they moved them here, east of Flagstaff, to the Raymond Wildlife Ranch and area. Like bovines, cows, bison are grazing animals. So they rely on things like the grass and the brush here on the plains to survive. Now grass is very tough and it's actually hard to digest. Humans, we can't eat and survive off of grass, but bovine and other grazing animals have actually four chambers of stomachs. So they will eat the grass, chew on it, digest it for a little bit, and then kind of cough it back up and chew the cud, digest it, cough it back up, so on and so forth, until it goes through all four chambers of their stomach. And that way, ruminants have really taken advantage of what is one of the largest resources in North America, the grass of the Great Plains or the high desert where we are today. So you can see the bison poop here. It looks pretty much just like cow poop. Cows are also eating the same thing, grasses. We just can tell it's bison poop because it's a lot bigger and this is a bison refuge. We don't want to get too close to these bison. Being the largest land mammals in North America, they don't really have very many natural predators outside of things like wolves. And to fend off the wolves, bison will actually confront them and possibly fight them. So they have these large heads, large shoulders, large bodies. They can do a lot of damage. So for us, we're going to get as close as we can to keep them comfortable, but I don't want to go right up to these bison and invade their space because they are much more imposing than I am. One of the most distinctive physical features of the bison is this large hump on their shoulders. And what that is, is an attachment point for large neck muscles. So those bison rely on the grasses to graze and eat and survive off of. During the winter time, heavy snowstorms across North America can cover these grasses and resources with inches or feet of snow. That large neck and large head of the bison is actually like a big snow plow. They'll swing their head back and forth from that hump and they'll plow through the snow to get at the grass underneath and they can survive. So even in the winter time, bison are perfectly happy out on the plains. They'll plow through the snow and their fur will actually get thicker and so thick to the point where even their own body heat won't melt the snow on the outside of the fur. That's how insulated they are. So again, they're a remnant of the Pleistocene, of the Ice Age. They evolved during this time of colder climates and harsher conditions. And today in North America, those adaptations are still at work. Like cows and other bovines, bison have horns. And what a horn is, there's a bony core, but it's mostly keratin growing away from that core. So the same stuff that our hair and fingernails are made out of. But that keratin is much harder in the horns and it grows throughout the bison's life. So that's another kind of protective adaptation they have. If they're threatened, that big head, those sharp horns, that's all a natural weapon that the bison can use to defend themselves. Looking back, it's incredible to think about how America's largest land mammal today is just a small cousin of the megafauna that once existed here during the Ice Age. It's also amazing to think about the fact that for thousands of years, millions of these animals roamed across the plains of North America. But in less than 100 years, we humans were able to pretty much drive them to the point of extinction. 
But then again, it's also amazing to think about how some humans, like Theodore Roosevelt, like Buffalo Jones, like the Native Americans, they appreciated the bison. And a hundred years ago, those conservation efforts that were done to preserve what few bison we had left have led to an expansion of the population. They're still in danger today, but they're doing much better than they were doing just over a hundred years ago. One of the amazing things about places like Arizona and the Southwest is actually the incredible diversity of life here. People think of Arizona as being kind of this dry, desolate desert, and it is a dry area, but here it's all about elevation. So right now we're standing at about 5,000 feet, and this is what you would call high plateau desert or kind of semi-arid grassland. You can see not a lot of trees are growing here. It's all low-lying shrubs and grasses. And that's because this area is not gonna see a lot of precipitation. But look just behind me, and way out in the distance there, you'll see a massive mountain. And on its peak, there's actually snow. So what's going on here is a relationship between pressure and temperature. And this all has to do with uh, what's called the ideal gas law. Anytime the temperature changes, the pressure will change and vice versa, anytime the pressure changes, the temperature will change. Now, you don't think of air as typically having a mass to it, but air is a molecule, it has a mass, it has a weight, and right now, at 5,000 feet, all of the atmospheric air above me is weighing down on me, comp compressing and creating pressure. Now, if I were to hike to the top of that mountain, well, that is about 7,000 feet above where we are right now. So at the top of that mountain, there's 7,000 feet of less air. So you actually have less pressure on you. And like I said, as the pressure decreases, the temperature is also gonna decrease. So while you can have snow at the highest elevations here in Arizona, you'll also have you know, wooded areas at lower elevations. So look right out over here. We've got a lava flow from the Anderson Mesa creating this uplifted area where you'll find pinyon and juniper trees. And then down here in the high desert, it's the grasses and the shrubs. And if we were to continue going further and further down in elevation, we'd eventually enter into the Sonoran Desert where things like cactus dominate the ecosystem. That biodiversity is very important here in Arizona. Just by slightly changing your elevation, you can have access to different resources, different plants, different kinds of vegetation, and it all has to do with pressure. Now, one other thing that is making this area slightly more dry than it needs to be is what's called the rain shadow effect. Basically here, most of our storms are coming off of the Pacific Ocean. So they move from west to east. Now as that storm hits Anderson Mesa, hits the San Francisco peaks, it's going to start to rain or snow potentially. Well, as it passes over the peaks, all that water it dumped on the windward side, now it's gonna have less water. And on the leeward side, there's this kind of rain shadow effect. You don't have as much moisture dropping right here. But for the animals here, that's okay. Because that snow that fell on Anderson Mesa well, it's gonna to start to drain down, making its way to the Little Colorado River and eventually into the Grand Canyon. So here you can also see some cuts and carves into the mesa as those drainages bring water down here into the more arid high desert region. Right now, we're only about 20 miles as the crow flies from the Raymond Wildlife Ranch area, but we're 2,000 feet above it. So we've increased our elevation by about 2,000 feet. Up here at 7,000 feet, you can see how much different the vegetation is. Like looking around, I see pinyon pine trees, juniper trees, down below us, ponderosa pine. Here's a great example of how that higher elevation, lower pressure, lower temperature leads to different conditions that are ideal for different types of vegetation. So again, here in Arizona, elevation is key. 
Now, up here at 7,000 feet, you are likely to get more snow and more rain. And you can see how down below us, a valley has been carved as water and rivers have flowed over this area for millions and millions of years. This is Anderson Mesa. Anderson Mesa is a volcanic flow from a shield volcano about 30 miles southwest of here. And like other shield volcanoes, it erupted with a lower viscosity basaltic magma and andesite magma. So it flowed kind of like a river of lava down across the landscape, covering the Colorado Plateau and making these elevated mesas. Then as the water flowed down, it carves these canyons and mountain ways. So what you're looking at over here, this is what's known as Lake Mary. But Lake Mary is a man-made lake. If you traveled back in time to the 1800s or earlier, this would have been a river. Oak Creek flowed through this area down to the west, actually around Anderson Mesa to the other side, eventually making its way through the Colorado Plateau into the Little Colorado River. But at the turn of the century, around the start of the 1900s, the Reardons, a couple of brothers, Mike and Tim, they were doing extensive logging here in northern Arizona, and they were some of the early settlers of Flagstaff. So as their lumber mills and the town of Flagstaff grew, they needed more and more water. So they came out here and dammed up the river, and that dam has created Lake Mary. Tim's daughter was named Mary, so the lake got named after her. Now, Anderson Mesa's high elevation is also a great place for stargazing. And for the past 100 years, Lowell Observatory here in Flagstaff has been using the high elevation of northern Arizona to conduct astronomical observations. Look up in the sky, and not many stars are out yet, but right above the horizon line, you see two bright spots. Now, they might look like stars, but each one of those bright spots is actually a planet. One of them is Jupiter, and one of them is Saturn. Now, Jupiter takes about 12 years to rotate around the sun, one full rotation. Saturn, it is even further out, so it takes about 30 years for it to orbit the sun. So it's not very often that those two planets are that close together. But every 800 years or so, the two planets will align. And over the next few nights, they're gonna get closer and closer and closer, and at one point might look like one massive star. Now this is also the week before Christmas, so some people have been calling this the Christmas star. And some believe that the story in the Bible of Jesus and Bethlehem and the wise men following the star, maybe this is what they were looking at. Not a star itself, but two planets reflecting sunlight so close together that they look like one massive star in the sky. 